So if you would open up your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to be starting in verse 12. Verse 12. All right. And if you are able, please stand as we read the word of the Lord. The Apostle James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Think about your favorite story. The most the, the best selling books, the best told stories, the, the the films that people love to go and watch, they always have something in common. In order to tell a good story, there has to be a conflict. There has to be something to overcome. James here is talking to people who are encountering trials. They are encountering things that there is... He doesn't get specific, but there are conflicts. There are things going on in their lives that they need to reckon with, that they need to consider. Often when we talk about our lives, I don't know about you, but there are times that I just wish my life would be easy and comfortable and that things would not go wrong. But that would make for an uninteresting, boring story. But when you think about your favorite stories and you think of these things, there's those, there are those trials that a character has to overcome. And I think it helps in our own lives when we put ourselves and realize that we are in a story that God is telling. And in what kind of character are we being in our stories? Now, we are not the main character. We are a side character when it comes to God's grand story. But there is a story that He is telling in your life. And will you be the hero or will God be the hero? And then when you are a side character in the stories of of, of others, whether that is your children, your friends, your co-workers, are you going to be somebody who encourages, encourages, them, them, encourages them on or... Are you going to be somebody who just brings them down? So when James is bringing in this topic of trials and temptations, these trials, these temptations, this is one of the things, one of the common themes that James talks about. He has several different themes talking about kind of the, the rich and the poor, talking about um, these trials and temptations. But he is bringing this one up in his, intro, in his first chapter, and he's, as he goes through James, he's going to bring it up over and over again. But what are the purposes? What is the purpose of trials? In stories, it is something that when, this character, it's, it, when the character has to overcome it, it makes for a good story, but it brings about a change in that character. The purpose of a trial is to bring about Christian maturity. There is something that you are to go through that is going to grow you in sanctification, that is going to purge sin from your life if you respond rightly. And then when you come out on the other side, you will be better for it. You will be more dependent upon God. You will have grown more in grace. 
That is, if it is done rightly. So we're looking at verses 12 through um, we're looking at verses 12 through 18 today, but he, this is not the first time where he mentions trials. In verse 2, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, you see there, he is telling them to look at these trials that they're encountering and to be happy about it. To be joyful for it. Count it a joy that these things are coming to you. Because it is working something in you. It is bringing about steadfastness. It is bringing about maturity. Now likely this kind of trial that they are going through. These things are perhaps they are being physically abused. Persecution. There could be, there are economic things that are happening. There was a time in the early church to where you could not go and buy things unless you had pinched a little incense to, a, to an idol to the, uh, saying you had worshipped the emperor. And Christians refused to do it. They were going through these trials. They were going through these persecutions. They were going through these relational conflicts. Because if you can imagine a pagan family, and, and we see this even now, to where when somebody says, I want to follow Jesus, I'm leaving all this behind, conflict happens. Trials come. But I want to make sure that as we look at this, that you do not see this passage at 2,000 years ago, and it doesn't apply to now. Remember, this is God's Word given to us for today, given to us for our time as well. So you may have a tendency in light of church history and even the news of happenings of Christians of, in other parts of the globe to minimize your own trials as if they don't matter because they're not the same. These Christians were going through persecution. They were going through physical abuse and economic hardship more than we are. I got called, I got called on Twitter recently, a retard. I was like, okay, God bless you, sir. <laughs> like, we don't encounter nearly as much stuff as, as they did, or people in other parts of the world where they're being, their families are just leaving them behind because they have left Islam and have gone to Christ. But yet, this is where, these words are for us as well. So it could not be further from the truth that this is not for us. Because if these trials of various kinds, if it only meant persecutions, then there would be next to nothing for testing and growing the faith of American Christians. If we believe the Bible is God's word for us, no matter the time and place, then, we simp then we, that simply cannot be true. Especially if we believe that God's providence is at work. So these trials, they're meant to bring about a testing of one's faith. A trial which has been providentially brought about by God has the purpose to bring about maturity in the believer. It is bringing down, as he says, producing steadfastness. Now, this word, John MacArthur points out that this word used for trial is the same one used in the verses we're going to be looking at later for temptation. And he said that that word, it means both of those things, but they can either have a negative or a, con uh, negative or a positive connotation depending upon its context. So I would argue that it doesn't, that what determines whether it is a trial or a temptation is how you respond to it. How do you respond to it? And this also has to do with even when um, how different kinds of trials. So for this, so the Christian in America who responds with faith to the daily mundane trials of life grows in greater sanctification than the Christian in Mauritania, West Africa, 
who responds with unbelief to the catastrophic extraordinary trials. We don't experience the same trials that others do across the globe, but that doesn't mean that they don't matter. If you respond to the trials that you experience, whether they must be just simply just um, uh, temptation or trials to, might, to grumble, to complain, to act out in disobedience or in anger or in slander. When you respond to those trials in faith, and choose obedience to obey what God says rather than what you desire to do, you, you, are, you are actually growing in a greater sanctification than the person who is a Christian in another country who is going through a severe persecution, but is not responding in faith, but is actually responding in unbelief and is responding into disobedience, whether that is anger or slander or other manner of sins. Remember, the size of the trial does not dictate the growth in sanctification, but rather response to it. So we see when he says in verse 2 through verse 4, and he talks about how, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, trials of various kinds. Saying what these things are supposed to be working in it. They're supposed to be working out that maturity. So you see, and you see that next that next uh, section. You see where there's an example of what going through, of what responding in obedience looks like. Because he says, and verse four, he says, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If you're growing in Christian maturity and you're growing, you're going to be lack, you're going to be uh, reducing how much you lack. You're going to be growing. But then he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, it's an example. Let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. So in a sense, that is a that is and it has to do without without doubting, but believing that God will do it. He has to respond in faith. So the right way to respond to a trial is in faith and in obedience. And so for that example that he gives of responding to your lacking in wisdom, you need wisdom to make a decision. You need wisdom about how to handle a situation. That in itself is a trial. It is a test. So trials and temptations... Does God bring these about? James 1.12 Blessed is the man who remains steadfast into trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Now, if we believe that God works in providence, that he is actually working things in our lives as the um, art of, um, Article 5 Section 2 of the 1689 says, All things come to pass unchangeably and certainly in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God, who is the first cause. Thus, nothing happens to anyone by chance or outside God's providence. Yet by the same providence, God arranges all things to occur according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or in response to other causes. So when it comes to trial, yes, God does bring it about. We see examples through Scripture. And He has a purpose for them. Remember, it is to grow you into maturity, but it is a way to test. Look at Job. Now you may be saying, whoa, whoa, that was Satan who did that. But remember what Satan had to do. He had to come before God and it was God who suggested Job. He said, have you considered my servant Job? And God placed limitations upon, upon what Satan could do. But it was a test. Job did nothing wrong. 
to deserve that. But it was to test his faithfulness. Also with that, we see though the Lord brings about trial as discipline. In Hebrews 12, quoting from Proverbs, it says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. There are times if there are not trials in your life in a way of discipline, then are you really a child of God? But also sometimes when the Lord brings about trial, it is a way, as we see here, to sanctify and to afflict. Psalm 119 says, I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous, that in your faithfulness you have afflicted me. This is something that people do not like to talk about. They think that only, that only things that are comfortable come from God. When you look at that and it says that every good and perfect gift, as we will look at, we will look at that verse, some people, what they don't realize is that in, they think that good only means comfortable and without pain. But sometimes the best, the best gifts come through Pain. Children are a wonderful thing. And yet what the mother has to go through in order to give birth to those children, it is painful. But that gift is great. And yet it is good. Look at what Christ went through on the cross for us so that we could be given this gift of life of forgiveness. It came through pain. So the Lord does bring about trial. He is sovereign over it. And He places boundaries upon it. And there is a purpose for them. Once again, an example would be the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians, he talks about how he has that thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment him. And he pleads for it to be taken away. And yet Jesus responds and tells him, my power is made perfect in weakness. We have no indication that it was ever taken away. He had that. He was afflicted. If Jesus could respond to him and say, my power is made perfect in weakness, my grace is sufficient for you, then he could have taken it away, but he didn't. He decided that it was going to stay because it was supposed to keep him humble. Matthew Henry says, Afflictions as sent by God are designed to draw out our graces, but not our corruptions. The origin of evil and temptation is in our own hearts. So remember, it's how you respond to the trial. So God brings about trial, but He does not bring about temptation. In case it needs to be any clearer, James says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Look at it. If Job, if Job would not have responded in faithfulness, if he would have gone the way and listened to his friends, and if he would have listened to his wife, and it would have just cursed God and died, that trial turned into the temptation because he responded in unbelief and disobedience. 
Same with Paul. If Paul would have responded in a way and he would have just, he, instead of, uh, he, how many times did Paul ever mention it? I don't know. We only have one instance in Scripture where he is mentioned of talking about the thorn in the flesh. And afterward, he doesn't make a big deal of it. He doesn't go on. He doesn't, he doesn't start whining and complaining. He doesn't start being bitter towards God because of what he's having to endure. He passed that test. He responded in faith to that trial. It did not turn into a temptation. In verse 12, when he says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Matthew Henry says this about it. He said, It is not every man who suffers who is blessed, but he who with patience and constancy goes through all difficulties in the way of duty. The trial goes awry when your response does. When it goes out of the bounds of what God has commanded. And it sounds so simple. That sin against God comes from disbelieving God. It comes from disbelieving His goodness, disbelieving His commands, that He knows what is best. That archetype of an example in the Garden of Eden. When the serpent tempted Eve and said, Did God really say? There are times when you may be going through a trial and you are tempted. You are tempted to question that God is even good. You're like, I'm going through this illness. How can God love me if this is what I'm going through? Or the people right now who have... Been in the, who are in the path of the hurricane and what they are going through. They're going through severe trial. And there are some who, will, who are responding in faith and in obedience and trusting God. And then there are others who are cursing Him. And it has turned into a temptation. I can't remember if I've mentioned it here before. Perhaps I have, but one of my a great illustration of, of figuring out what is at the root of sin is looking at it like a tree, and you have this tree, and you have this sin, and it's this fruit. And what you need to do is you need to trace it back and figure out what the root of that is. And usually if you do, you're tracing it back and you're finding out it is rooted in some sort of unbelief. An unbelief that you have about God. I first read about that from the book Gospel Fluency, where he, where the, the author is given an example of his wife, who she had this, this uh, great anxiety, sending her kids off to school, and she's just standing there, just worrying, anxious. And her husband comes to her and he's like, Well, what's going on? And she's like, I'm just I'm just worried. And he's like, well, what are you believing about God in this moment? He's like, well, that he's not going to take care of them. And he helped her figure out that that fruit, that, that, that sin was the fruit of some unbelief. Are there trials right now in your life that you are responding to in unbelief? And there is that temptation to sin. Are you afflicted in some way and are having to make a decision about how you are to respond? Perhaps you are being afflicted with singleness. And instead of responding with patience and contentment, there is that sin, that temptation to respond with lust and self-pity. Or perhaps you have an overbearing boss. And so instead of responding to that boss with kindness and patience, you respond with grumbling 
complaining and anger. Or perhaps you are going through a trial of a cluttered house. Very common with children. And instead of responding with gratefulness for all that you have been given, the house that you have been given, the children that you have been given, you are giving over to whining and anger. Or perhaps you have the trial of disobedient children, so instead of responding with kindness, as God does to you, you respond with anger, yelling, wrath. These are just a few examples of trials that we encounter and how we can choose to respond to them with obedience, or we can choose to respond to them in disobedience. And James says, he says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Your will is then suddenly trumping God's will in your life. You're choosing what you want instead of what God has for you. And it goes on, then desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. Think about that. That is a startling picture. That desire when it is conceived it gives birth to sin. <laughs> It's talking about like as if, as if, as if like you're bringing forth some child. It's meant to arrest you. It's meant to startle you and get you to think. There is a legacy. Sin doesn't just remain stagnant. It grows. You may fail a trial and respond in this way and give in to the temptation and respond and grumbling and complaining, but at some point you may respond to that kind of trial in a way that it's going to lead to something worse, something more. The legacy of sin is death. As I've mentioned, as we've gone through Ephesians about how sin, it has brought forth death and misery upon the human condition. Now I say there is no need to bring about a fictional illustration of the effects of sin. Because we see it all around us. Perhaps we have just grown used to it and no longer really notice. As most of you know, I work in a hospital. So I work in the pharmacy, and I don't really have anything to do with emergencies unless they call the pharmacy and ask for something to be made. But there is a time when you've worked in that place for years, and you hear code blue come across, come across the speaker that you just carry on with your day. But stop and think about that. What is happening right there in that moment? Somebody is dying. The effects of sin are playing out. The curse is having its way. Death is eating. That is the effect of sin. The diseased and withering tree the dying plants in your garden are an effect of sin in this world. The flood waters of Hurricane Helene are the signs of sin's legacy. I would say, but thanks be to God, though, that where sin does abound, grace abounds all the more. For just as an example about like the hurricane, there are so many people, there are churches, there are ministries that are responding. And they are, they are bringing in supplies, they are caring for those, they are, they are rescuing people. That is just an example of how God works through His people to minister to the broken. The people who need 
truth. And who knows, perhaps, maybe when you respond to something like this, you, you help out with the trial. Maybe you have a friend in crisis and you come to their side. They are reckoning with the effects of their sin or the sin of others and they don't know what to do. They are tempted to respond towards God in anger. But you can be the one to come there and to remind them of grace and remind them of the way that God is calling them to. Now as James is bringing this up, he is... He's having to, he is having to, he's having to discuss how these people are responding to trials, yes, and bringing about temptation. There are some who are maligning God, blaming Him for some sort of malfeasance in their life, saying, God tempted me, because they have responded in unbelief. And so James is coming in and he's saying, no, no. And he tells them, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Remember, every good thing doesn't always, it, it doesn't mean it's going to be comfortable. But he is trying to bring them, remind them of God's goodness. He's trying to, and he's going to show them an example. But we see, and we see that there are testimonies of God's goodness everywhere. There's testimonies of God's goodness elsewhere in Scripture. For example, the Sermon on the Mount. Talking about the provision that God gives to us. When we want to respond in anxiety... And Jesus says, don't be anxious. The Father will provide for you. A testimony of God's goodness. The fact that He even brings rain, as Jesus says to you, He even brings rain on the evil and the good. The fact that we have air to breathe, that our hearts are still going, is evidence of God's goodness. Is evidence of God's kindness of His mercy. We also see a testimony of God's goodness in the lives of other believers. Answered prayers. Blessings given. So there's a kind of that is kind of an experiential kind of evidence of God's goodness. And I'm sure we can all think of many. If we stop and think, we can think of many ways that God has been good to us this past week. Even perhaps if we have given into trial and have turned it into a temptation. And yet God is still good. But I love this though, how James does this. He says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He doesn't change. He doesn't shift. He is not like the sun that goes across the sky, casting shadows this way and that. As he rises and he sets, he is constant. He does not change. But he goes on to say, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Do you want further proof of God's goodness? James says, look in the chairs around you. One another. We are a testimony to God's goodness that he has brought us to life and saved us and brought us here together. You are a testimony to God's goodness to one another. 
But not only that. It's not as only a testimony of God's goodness. But the community of faith is also a testimony to God's promises. And it is a surety of Christ's promised return. If you dig deep in James, you're going to see throughout it how Christ's return is a source of hope. That Christ's return is something to bank your faith on. He's already alluded to it twice in just this one passage. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. We don't get that crown of life now. But then also when he talks about looking at one another, and he says, we, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The life that God has given us is just a foretaste of what He will do. The sanctification that He is bringing you through is just, a, is just a little bit of what He's going to bring to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. It is meant to bring us hope. It is meant to keep us looking forward. Sometimes looking to the future looks bleak, but that's when we do not consider God's promises. And we do not consider that, Christ, that God brings His people through trials. There very well may be greater trials coming. We don't know. We can speculate. But let's not worry. Let's not wring our hands. Let's not rage. Let us trust. Let's walk in faith and in obedience. We don't always see what God is doing, but that doesn't, that doesn't negate the command to believe. In Hebrews 11 Verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now I didn't really have this in my notes, but I want to make sure that we get this picture, okay? Because we can... It, it, it matters how we respond to trial, okay? But... Where he leaves this, this next, the next passage is important. It says, Know this, my beloved brothers, verse 19 of James 1. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. When he's talking about being quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger, many commentators think that what he's saying there about being quick to hear, it's not really talking about, the, although the principle can be applied, about being, being quick to hear other people talk. But in the context, it's being quick to hear what God is saying. Being quick to hear the Word. Because if you do not know what the Word says, how can you respond in obedience? How can you be a doer if you don't hear? But, as he says, you can be a hearer and not be a doer. 
These people that he is talking to were in the church. They were hearing the truth preached, but yet they still were trying to blame God for their disobedience. We can't just listen to what God says. We have to listen to what God says and actually do it. And by God's grace, by the power of His Spirit, we will be quick to hear. This whole looking forward to the end when Christ will return and looking in faith, walking daily in obedience, Reminds me of this passage from the Valley of Vision where it says, My heaven-born faith gives promise of eternal sight. My new birth a pledge of never-ending life. I draw near to thee, knowing thou wilt draw near to me. I ask of thee, believing thou hast already given. I entrust myself to me, the eternal God, for the comfort of these thoughts, the joy of these hopes. As we encounter trials, may we respond with the truth of the gospel. And when we fail and we give in to temptation, may we respond again with the truth of the gospel. That you can repent and be forgiven. But God does not hold that against you. Let's pray. Our most gracious God, I thank you for your word and the truths that you have reminded us of today. I thank you that you are working in our lives in ways that we see and that we cannot see. You're not working only just in our lives, but also in the lives of others, bringing about your grand story. I pray that we would respond in faith, that you would, that you would cause us to respond in faith, that you would empower us with your spirit, to respond in faith in our trials. And where we respond in unbelief and choose sin instead of obedience, I pray that we would be swift to repent and turn back to you. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.